The speed of innovation is one that always outpaces security. And oftentimes when looking at new things in security, it's merely a reflection of the past in a new form. That holds true today when thinking about cybersecurity and operational risk. When I say operational risk, I'm referencing all the people, process, and technology used to operate a business, whether it's a life-sustaining medical device for healthcare, an industrial control system running a power grid, a smart sensor telling us when plane engines will start to malfunction, or that the water level has risen too high in an area so that precautionary measures can be taken. The technology has become smarter and smaller, and when thinking about the operations of the business, especially in industries where people's lives could be at risk, there's nothing that will slow down the pace of innovation and the pace of adoption of this technology. And our traditional security methodologies and controls must do a better job of evolving to meet the business need. When I was in the healthcare world, I used to tell the executives and the board that cybersecurity and patient care are intimately connected, as is almost every other industry. It's now more important than ever to start bridging cybersecurity and operational risk, the business operation, into one. Having them as separate functions won't give you the full picture of who's interested in attacking you, what an attacker is doing, how they compromise your organization, and the steps that led them into your operational technology environments. The great news is that the capabilities exist today and can be mostly a fundamental shift in our behaviors and how we view these areas of our business. So with that, some of the items we'll talk about today is, is I'll give you a brief overview of my background and how it relates to operational technology and operational risk an overview of the OT landscape, the significance of the OT in the MENA region, uh, how to improve your cybersecurity strategy, and examples of a, a few use cases that we've been uh, directly involved with as it relates to protecting operational technology. So a little about me, uh, James Carter. I'm the Chief Security Officer for Logarithm, and I'm also the VP of an R&D group called Logarithm Labs that really focuses on threat research, compliance research, and operational risk and operational technology. I've been a logger than six years. Uh, prior to that, uh, I spent had stints in the DOD or US government, uh, being an exploit developer, being a pen tester, ethical hacker, security operations person. Uh, and then I went on to consulting and uh, became a security consultant, exploit developer, pen tester for, for IBM X-Force and then later on uh, became employee 53 at a company called Mandiant where I got to respond to a you know, number of the sort of newsworthy global intrusions um, involving operational technology and others. And then I spent a couple of years directly in healthcare as a deputy CISO at a world-renowned healthcare organization in Minnesota, uh, where many of the MENA region uh, heads of nations go to get their treatment. Um, and so overall, it's been about 23 years. I got started when I was 18 years old. So I've been 23 years dedicated to information and cybersecurity. So when thinking about the threat landscape, I think historically uh, there's been one viewpoint as when people say operational technology, they think of the utility sector, manufacturing, industrial control systems, um, and, and that these are air-gapped environments that are not connected to our corporate network. And I think what you'll find today is that, that that is definitely a thing of the past. When looking at all the industry verticals that we have, all of them, even in the US that, that make up our list below of the graphic here of the critical infrastructure uh, that we have in the US, it pretty much impacts every single industry and every single company that supports those industries. And so when you look at it today, I think healthcare, when you think about their diagnostics and monitoring and biomedical systems, and now the, the sort of explosion of telehealth, um, and then you have the finance and the ATM networks, and then you have smart cities like uh, Dubai as an example, states and smart nations. I spent uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I spent some time in Singapore uh, where they're really heavily investing in, in becoming a smart nation. And then obviously use of it in the DOD, which is where I think a lot of the OT probably started, uh, but looking at drones and tanks and planes and submarines and machine guns and even other weapons that are being smarter and leveraging more technology to do the work that was previously done by a human. So organizations that are vulnerable, um, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, this air gap notion, I don't think really exists that much anymore. Um, even those companies and organizations that, that, that say that they have an air gapped environment, I think oftentimes you'll see is there still movement interconnectivity, whether it be a USB device that, that moves from the commercial side into the air gapped environment, a laptop that moves across the air gap. So you're basically bridging the air gap anyways. So I think that, that OT systems in general 
um, are, are being less and less air gapped. Um, and then, you know, when you look at OT in general, um, they're heavily reliant on IT systems and the internet. And obviously, uh, when you have that interconnectivity with IT systems and the internet, that really just, just gets rid of your entire air gap uh, as well. Um, and I think that, you know, when you look at how these operational technology are built, they're built for functionality and accessibility meaning they were not build, uh, built with security in mind and oftentimes don't include some of the basic capabilities and controls within the technology. We know that security is expensive when you think about compute resources and, and what it takes. And oftentimes the, the manufacturers will focus on functionality and accessibility of the product and less so on spending those resources, those really critical resources on the security side of things. And then when you look at how we prevented uh, and protected these environments in the past, you know, we talked about the air gapped environments. We use traditional preventative controls like firewalls and antivirus and patch management. Uh, whenever, you know, you look at the native capabilities of some operational technology and the native capabilities, the intended functionality of that technology is actually more dangerous than the vulnerable you may try to exploit or need to exploit at some other time. And so you may or, or you may never have to uh, exploit the vulnerability at all because the native functionalities are there that give you what you need to accomplish your mission as an attacker. And so when I talk about the spread of OT and the convergence with OT and IT, I want to give a few examples. Um, the first one was was 40 percent of survey respondents use cloud services in their environments. And this is especially true. I mean, when I was in healthcare, we were pushing medical records and patient information into the cloud and having, having it be accessible by insurance providers and medical care providers, et cetera. 30% of OT systems are connected by some form of wireless. So, you know, all the sensor technology, especially that's out there on the internet, uh, communicating back, providing uh, some critical infrastructure functionality and capability is connected to, controlled, managed by some form of wireless, whether it be general wireless signal, cellular, or even Bluetooth. And I think another key component is when you start looking at, you know, where OT is going, uh, you know, I think historically, you know, OT was managed by a workstation or a server in the healthcare field. We had things called PAC systems that would actually manage and operate the medical device, uh, but now they're going mobile. So you'll see more iPads and iPhones and things that have mobile applications on them that can actually control all aspects of the OT environment. When you think of the threat landscape, uh, I think this is pretty prevalent across every single industry. I think uh, specifically with OT, when looking at the attack vectors, you know, obviously physical access is one, one aspect of things. Is someone breaking into a facility, accessing your operational technology, uh, performing whatever mission that they wanted to perform and then getting out. Uh, but I think you have other attack vectors now as well, especially whenever those systems are interconnected with IT systems or connected to the internet remote trusted access and service maintenance and consultant consulting. And I think if you if you you, you can actually even bridge both of those together, because oftentimes it is very common for a vendor to come in and say, I need to provide maintenance or I need to uh, provide some level of consulting on a specific uh, device that's in your environment. They may or may not use change management and have change windows, but at the end of the day, they're not flying a resource into your facility to fix that system. They're actually remotely access, uh, accessing that system from the internet and from their locations. And so with that native and inherent capability that's already there, um, it also provides accessibility to all folks that are on the internet, all companies, organizations, individual attackers that are on the internet potentially. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the native capabilities of the OT being leveraged more so than the vulnerabilities associated with that OT device or system. From a threat actor perspective, you know, OT is, is really a target for a myriad of threat actors. You have the general hackers attacking operational technology to shut down businesses or hold businesses hostage for ransomware. You have nation state threat actors that do things like shut down the production of nuclear facilities and, and uh, prevent nuclear weapons from being manufactured. You have employees and insiders can often also go hand in hand with nation state threat actors. When you have someone on the inside that's either trying to steal information to supply it to another nation state or they're trying to somehow sabotage uh, the company or the or the facility or the or the piece of infrastructure. And then you have the vulnerable systems. You have SCADA systems that um, and you have embedded controllers. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in healthcare, we have things called PAC systems. These are same similar to PLCs or their embedded controllers that help uh, operate the actual industrial control systems. And then when you look at the devices that are that are 
in the ICS, SCADA, IoT, OT, P PLCs, and PAC systems, it's all running some native form of Linux or Windows. Uh, it may not be a specific version, but it's definitely some component of Windows or Linux usually. And so when you start thinking about that, the inherent vulnerabilities of those operating systems, um, and especially if these systems can't be touched or patched or upgraded, uh, you're gonna have some significant vulnerabilities associated with just the operating system that it relies on. So what does this mean for the MENA region? Um, I think one of the, you know, a few different, you know, different and differentiating pieces make this more applicable for the MENA region than probably the rest of the globe. And I think when you look at the MENA region, a lot of the industry is obviously very OT heavy with oil and gas. You know, 50% of the gas reserves reside in the MENA region. Uh, then you have smart cities like Dubai as an example and continued investment in other cities that are actually in the MENA region that are investing in becoming smart cities and smart nations. And then you look at the percentage of attacks on OT. And globally, 4% of the attacks, uh, cyber attacks are against OT. Within the MENA region, that number is 30%. 30% of the attacks in the MENA region target operational technology. That's a significant gap. And I think that's why the, the MENA region itself experiences this and has a need to protect this uh, probably above and beyond every other country in the world. So how do you improve your strategy? I think the first thing is with any security leader, security practitioner, CISO, uh, is gaining that executive buy-in. And I think you know one of the things that um, I used to say in healthcare all the time is that cybersecurity is directly uh, impact and influential of patient care. Meaning that if you wanna have the best patient care in the world, you have to have the most secure patient care in the world. And I think a lot of times, even in today, a lot of businesses, the board, the executive team, don't think about the technology that operates the business as the same thing as cybersecurity. And they keep them in two separate silos or two separate buckets, when really what we need to do as security leaders is be able to educate the business on why they are interrelated and why we should combine them together. Now with that, I would say a lot of CISOs struggle with speaking the language of the business, so therefore they have a hard time gaining the buy-in and educating the staff, educating the board and the executive team on why they're interconnected. And so, you know, using things like, you know, $22,000 a minute for downtime of an OT environment is a great way to, to demonstrate the dollar value of maintaining uh, the reliability of that environment. And so if someone experiences a one hour outage, that's $1.2 million that uh, they've lost. And, and I think that, that's, that's before you even get into the actual reputational damage. I mean, us as a security company, if we got breached, um, that would be a significant reputational and brand damage for us and have an impact on our revenue. The same thing could be said for a power grid shutting down or a device manufacturer or people within the OT space itself. Employ and integrate tools and best practices. You know, as we talked about earlier, IT and OT are converging into one. Uh, let's lever some of that. I think we do that today with things like network segmentation and multi-factor authentication, um, encryption and detection and response controls, uh, meaning that, uh, as you can see here, that, that puts OT and IT on the same infrastructure, uh, but leveraging some of the best practices uh, that, that you we leverage on the IT side along with the OT itself. And then I think, you know, having visibility and understanding of that environment, I think it's really interesting for companies to say, especially security leaders to say that they're securing their business, they're protecting the business, they're able to defend and respond to it whenever they don't even have any of the business operating technology integrated into their security practices and, and security platforms. Um, and so the same security platforms, uh, at the end of the day, an OT device is, is simply a computer, just as an IT device is. And so whenever you think about it from that perspective, there's no reason uh, because there's no really barrier to entry. It's really easy. It should be easy to integrate operational technology into your IT cybersecurity platforms. And I think the other key component here is baselining. Um, the one really awesome thing about, um, there's many awesome things, but one really awesome thing about operational technology and industrial control systems is that they behave the exact same way almost every single time. Meaning that a you know a MRI or imaging system for in healthcare will operate the exact same way. You put a patient into the MRI machine, they do their scans, it operates a certain way, the communication back to the PAC system is a certain way. The same thing can be said for other industrial control systems, other OT environments. 
And so when you when you think about it from that perspective, the, the profile is fairly standard. And with that standardized profile, it actually makes it really easy to look for behavior changes. Now, those behavior changes could be associated with the operations of the actual uh, medical device or the actual industrial control system or, or OT, or it could be related to a cybersecurity issue. So some use cases that we've been involved in, you know, and I, and I look at this is an actual use case for an organization that wanted to monitor and provide visibility to their water systems. And so obviously, you know, when you look at the dashboards and, and gaining that visibility and being able to pull that data in, a couple key components here, it's not just cybersecurity related, even though you might be pulling this into a cybersecurity platform, but there could be operational risk here that you want to be able to profile and baseline and understand when there are spikes and troughs in certain activity and how that may impact the operations of your business and that technology system. You want that visibility over time. You want to know, in particular for the water system, whether the pH levels are, are at the right levels or not. Uh, when have they? When do they inject chlorine into the system? How does that correspond to the pH levels and the timing? That those are all operational risk items that you want to have uh, visibility into be and be very much aware of what's happening because you know that could be do things. Uh, there could be some catastrophic pieces here that you could detect early from an operational risk perspective that could prevent. And, and, and a, some type of incident, whether that be a security incident or another incident. And then being able to detect things. If someone poisons the water, you should see data coming in that actually reflects different changes and variations in that. Without the visibility, without the data coming into it, and without being able to uh, look at that over time, it'd be very hard potentially to detect that type of activity. But whenever you have all that data coming in um, and you understand the baselines of the system and how they operate, you should be able to drill into any of these types of things that are outside of normal and being able to investigate and, and make appropriate uh, responses. Same thing with telehealth. I think this is a really interesting one where we look at a dashboard uh, giving visibility into telehealth sessions and Zoom calls that, that are being leveraged for telehealth and being able to eavesdrop on that to be able to gain credentials of a physician or a nursing staff or, or something of the like to be able to leverage in an IT attack. And then looking at when you dig into that and you have the visibility monitoring into the IT environment, you can actually see that those credentials are being leveraged uh, from an IT or from the North from North Korea. So you have another nation state now accessing your environment, gathering information in the telehealth session to send you an email. And then from that email, they get all everything that they need. You can also include, incorporate physical access when the when the doctor or physician or nursing staff badges in. But then you look at the attacker using those credentials that they stole from that particular physician and being able to access the environment and then laterally move to the patient care system or pay our electronic health record system. And so you've got OT sitting in the front end of this where you're using the telehealth session and then OT again is sitting in the back end of this with the electronic health records access and IT bridging it all together. So with that, I wanted to summarize by saying a few different things here. Uh, for a security practitioner leader, uh, you can't really have, say that you have a sound security program without full visibility and the same capabilities to protect, detect, and respond into your OT, IoT, and ICS environments. Uh, I think that there's gonna be continued focus in these environments. There is probably not as much today as there should be. And I think that it's going to be growing at a pretty rapid pace um, because at the end of the day, the core operation technology that operates your business and generates the revenue uh, is, is going to be more and more of a focus for cybersecurity. And then I think the last thing I'll, I'll leave you with is that the people, process, and, te and technology exist today and they must be incorporated into your security program and business processes. So re-leverage the existing capabilities in your IT and your cybersecurity side to be able to uh, pull in the IoT, IoT, and ICS side to have a complete visibility end-to-end -end of, of things that are interconnected between those worlds. And, and so I think that's going to be start becoming a, a central part of every security program and business process. So with that, I wanted to say thank you for your time today. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about this uh, really uh, awesome topic and something that I think is going to be, uh, you know, well into the next 10 years, something that will be a high profile. Uh, and I want to say thank you and enjoy the rest of your conference.